Native American um, uh, fighters memorial at the same spot. Um, what about the title of the location, the high ground? You guys can help me out. Hi, take a look. Uh, that's where you want to be. Right, you want to be on the high ground combat because you, it's better to fight from being above than below. What other connections do we have with high ground? The, lo the physical location here is literally a high point in central Wisconsin, so you get to see a lot of the state from this location, so that is that view. Think of the high ground as being like a like a holy place. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, you know uh, um, the the transfiguration happened on the top of a hill. Right. That you know, hey, we should build a, a, a tent up here. We should build a, a shrine up here. This this was holy ground. We went up to this high place and it was holy. Moses received ten commandments on high ground. So sacred location. What else? I'm not taking a political side here, but can you finish this for me? Uh, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, you go high. In an argument, I'm going to take the higher ground, right? I'm, I'm not going to get down in the gutter with you. I'm taking the higher ground. So this, this title of this location is really thoughtful. It has at least four layers of meaning. This is postmodern. Where, where we are allowed to spend some time with this and make significant connections and have this stuff unfold for us. I'm skipping into another area. This is, a, this is a, in my opinion, the most significant sculpture created in the second half of the 20th century. It's entitled The Dinner Party by Judy Chicago. Uh, here are other pieces. This is a giant quilt by Judy Chicago, and this is a uh, item of clothing by Judy Chicago, so I thought I'd include this. Uh, Judy Chicago, in this case, for her dinner party, created 33 place settings for significant women throughout history. And then these tiles on the inside, and this is an actual table, so this is a massive room-sized sculpture. And then these are triangular shaped tiles, and in each one of these tiles is the name of a significant woman, a female saint, or, or somebody across the world throughout history. So 999 women are represented at the dinner party. She invited all of these historical women to be at the same place. Oh, cool. Right. Uh, this happened in 1973. Uh, uh, Judy Chicago is considered to be sort of the pinnacle of the feminist art movement, one of the postmodern art movements, right? And so she created a, the dinner table in a very specific shape. The triangle, which is related to female anatomy. Right? This is not a, an accident that this is a triangular table and not a rectangular table. And her, her, uh, her uh, uh, design ideas and, and the background goes further than just that. Notice the triangle is also present here. Um, but also she has been mindful of the uh, traditional arts that women practice. So she sewed this and embroidered all of the names of, of the invitees on, right, needlework. She chose this medium because it was connected to traditional female art roles across the world. Across the world, potters are mostly women in traditional societies. Here in America, uh, you can find a lot of women practicing China painting, which is you know, sort of in their retirement. They get a, uh, a porcelain plate, and then they paint it, and then they fire it at, the, at this you know, little shop. And so she actually created all of these plates and then China painted all of the plates in order to be the, the invitations. And the plates themselves actually are also related to uh, a female anatomy. We don't need to go too much further in this. But sort of very thoughtfully choosing um, not only the material but the design to say, hey, women are really significant and we're ignored. 
really the only way to get into a museum if you're a woman is if you're nude and on the painting. Then you can be in a museum, but if you're a female artist, museums don't collect you. And ironically, this highly significant piece, once it was shown and created uh, just incredible acclaim internationally, and is in all of the textbooks. This piece is, is featured as one of the great high moments of late 20th century art. Sat in storage in a basement for 30 years before a minor museum picked it up and, and now has it in their collection. As if it was to say, well, yeah, duh, it's a woman artist, you know, we're not, we're not going to deal with it. Oh, really important postmodern work and taking it from a tradition of a non-traditional perspective 1973 art from a woman's perspective as opposed to the male heroic artists that we keep on bringing forward speaking of this have people are people familiar with this project this is the aids quilt in the 1980s people were dying left and right from aids and somebody had this idea, you know what we should do? We should make a quilt for Bob or whoever it was who passed on. Um, and the quilt, of course, is a sign of warmth and comfort and love. If you receive a quilt from your grandma, you think of your grandma when you climb in bed and it's warm and cozy or when you sit on the couch in front of your TV in the winter. You know, a quilt, it's a quilt, right? It's a coming together of things. And so people started making quilts of the people who were passing on to the maids. And uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, right, was, was uh, president in 1980, 1981 to 88, right, beginning of 89, Ronald Reagan's time. He never, ever in his presidency, would, and the, at the height of the battle, couldn't say the word AIDS. He would say that that scourge of a disease, he would reference it, but he could not bring himself to say AIDS because of its connection with homosexuality. So in order to raise awareness, people said, you know what we should do with these quilts? We should gather them, and we should bring them to Washington, D.C. And they laid them out on the, on the mall. These are all, each one of these little guys is a different person who had passed on from the disease, and it covered them all. And there was still, there was still more people who, who they couldn't fit into. It was an incredible presence, an incredible project. Um, Okay, I've got this, we're doing pretty well. I've got nine minutes left. We're on track. Uh, here is Dred Scott Tyler. All right, Dred Scott Tyler. Anybody heard of this guy? Anybody heard of Dred Scott? Dred Scott, heck yeah. Tell me about Dred Scott. A little bit? I've heard, I can't fully remember what it was all. Anyone? We'll simply say famous African American from uh, from from history, right? Um, um, there's a famous. Oh, uh, he was the, the, he was he was supposed to be for slaves to be free, like when they escaped, they could be returned back if they were caught. Right, and and it was a law case, <coughs> a very famous um, uh, thing that sort of contributed to bringing forth the emancipation. So he's a very significant. Uh, you know, case in the, the history of African American people in the context of who are we in the United States? What are our rights? What what is our role? And these these things are still a question to us, right? These these things. It's not like we settled it. Oh well, you know, Lincoln emancipated slaves. All all things are okay. Or Johnson signed civil rights. All things are okay. Just look at our election. Right? We, got significant issues. Look at Black Lives Matter. We got significant issues, right? Still. So, Dred Scott. His name is Scott Tyler. His nickname is Dred. And when he was a student, undergraduate, at the uh, uh, Chicago University in Chicago, um, uh, he made this image, which made him uh, really unpopular. The title of the piece is, What is the Way to Display the U.S. Flag? And we have here uh, a picture, a photograph of the US flag covering a, 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 a coffin. And then we have here a description in a book of how you're supposed to display and not display the US flag. And one of the rules that I learned in Boy Scouts is that you're never supposed to allow the US flag to touch the ground. 
fact, if it touches the ground, we were told we were supposed to properly dispose of the flag. How do you properly dispose of the flag? You burn it. You burn it, right? And he put an actual US flag down here. So if you wanted to read how to properly display the flag, you had to stand on the flag. It was read as a powerfully anti-American statement. This, uh, this student had gone too far, had violated the flag. In, in, in 1989, there were actually congressional hearings related to this piece of artwork. And people were talking about, hey, you know, people are burning the flag. And then there's this, there's this Scott Tyler kid who's, who's doing these things. It's the American flag. We shouldn't allow it. And, and there was a, a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of lawmakers who were, who were um, making a lot of political hay and saying, we've got to protect the dignity of the flag. The flag is important. Meanwhile, I remember receiving in the mail from the party who was making the most noise about this a, a suggest vote for us and, and then there's a little bit of paraphernalia in this you know it was, it was, it was too resident you know it, was, it, was, it wasn't to me personally resident and one of the things that I got was a plastic uh, bag with a US flag on it that you could hang in your car and put your garbage in there. It's a little, <laughs> little travel garbage bag. And I'm going, these guys are worried about the American flag, and they're sending this out in their stuff where they're in their letter writing about it was just irony. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're sending me an American flag garbage bag when you're talking about how Scott Tyler was using the flag. And of course, Scott Tyler was saying, freedom of speech, the flag is such a powerful, iconic image. It is a way for us to get attention, right? Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem brings attention to, to Black Lives Matter, saying, we're not yet full, full, full citizens here in the United States. Please pay attention, right? It is an act. It is a, it is a uh, whether you agree with it or not, it is a visible performance related to nationalism, right? National pride of the American flag that he's saying, Hey, there's still work to be done here. Right? So that's what this is happening. Uh, here, a revolutionary performance, good old Dred Scott has taken the Declaration of Independence that says, we the people, and lights it on fire and burns it. Hey, hey, that's, that's an important document. That says, that says, we the people. Yeah, which people? All people? Certainly that doesn't feel like it. So I just like you to pay attention. Right? Really incredible stuff. Our last image is not from the United States. Hmm. Our second to last image is not from the United States. This is Ai Weiwei. I, I have one more to start about this. This is Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei is a, uh, uh, a Chinese artist from mainland China, communist China, right? And he is he's one of my favorite contemporary ceramic artists, uh, although he thinks he's a sculptor. He works in my field, so I claim him, right? <laughs> uh, he has taken and made porcelain sunflower seeds. Each one of these things is an individual sunflower seed that he has made and painted. He's got others. And then he has filled this gallery in this museum eight inches deep with these sunflower seeds. And if you and, and you're meant to go and interact with them. You can pick them up and type, here he is. Oh, here are my sunflower seeds. And, uh, uh, and so you can interact with them. You can make little mounds of them. What was this process for making those seeds? Press mold. Okay. Yeah. So just but then they're hand painted. But it's China. And labor is cheap. Okay. So you hire a bunch right. of people. Your job is to put stripes on these. Each one is individual. So you can pick up any individual like snowflakes. No two sunflower seeds are exactly the same size or have the same paint job. They are all individuals. Why would anybody do this? I mean, it's impressive, but is he doing it just to impress us? Think of it in terms of China. There are 1.1 billion people in China. We talk about China as a mass, but in fact, his argument, we are individuals, and our government does not pay attention to us as individuals. They treat us like a mass. He's a protest artist. 
saying we are not being treated the way other free countries are treating their individuals. We're not allowed to say what we need to say. He's a really cool guy. Uh, when uh, Beijing had the Olympics, they commissioned him to design their natatorium, the swimming, swimming area, the nest. They paid him a whole bunch of money to design the nest. And he accepted the money, but he refused to go in it. He was invited to the grand opening. He said, no, I don't want anything to do with your, with your nationalistic pride. <laughs> so he's been jailed multiple times for, for basically doing these types of protests. This is the last slide right here. And I, I want to, uh, oh my God, I'm sorry. Uh, Neil Tetkowski from my field, Common Ground World Project, he sent out information through the UN to every nation on the planet asking for people to pull clay out of, the, out of, out of their natural earth and send it back to Neil. Right? And then he made this giant uh, clay piece. It's about 13 feet across. And then each one of these tabs spiraling outwards is made from different clay from different nations uh, that are members of the UN. Right at the center, we have two handprints. This is the handprint of this woman. She was 100 years old when he impressed her hand in the clay. And this is the hand of, a, of an infant pressed in. And uh, his idea was the idea of, we have this common ground, literally, of course, clay, the ground that we walk on. But we as human beings, we as the human race, have common ground, have more in common than we have separate. And so he installed this giant piece in the UN as a way of talking about how we can unify the world rather than divide the world. Um, um, and and uh, uh, you know, really nice. And then has these vials of clay that are all labeled and where they came from and who sent them. And so for the opening of this piece, many people traveled or at least were excited to hear my clay from my village is a part of this thing here at the UN. Interestingly enough, the UN no longer has it. In order to donate art to the UN, you also have to provide for its uh, a lifetime of upkeep, and that would be about a million dollars over its lifetime. And so Neil Tetkowski said, I, I can't do so. They said, you've got to take it away. So this piece is now in storage, uh, not being shown in any place. But the idea of taking that which is common to us, the clay out of which we are made, on which we stand, unites us as a human race. This is postmodern clay, trying to make a statement about uh, what the arts can do to bring us together as a people. Thank you.